Alrighty. Well, welcome everyone. So um, while people trickle in, I might just give you a short introduction, Andrew, if you don't mind. Um, welcome everyone. So this is the first street level good urbanism talk. It's really, really exciting to have Andrew here today. Um, I think we've got people from all over the world. So, so welcome. Um, so Andrew Cameron describes himself as an engineer helping to make great places, which I really, really like because it is more unusual than it should be. Um, and calling the talk The Joy of Streets wasn't our idea, it was Andrew's idea. So that tells you a little bit about Andrew. Uh, it's also his Twitter handle um, if you want to follow Andrew on Twitter. Um, so Andrew thinks that streets should bring joy to people and communities, and we quite agree with that. Um, for those of you who don't know Street Level, we're a membership and policy advocacy organisation focused on good urbanism and, and traditional architecture. Um, so you can um, check us out via our website. But I think it's a really uh, timely session um, to do because the New South Wales government, um, for the first time in my knowledge for an Australian government, have just released a, um, have just released a policy statement recognising the difference between roads and streets for the first time here, which the UK did a long time ago. And Andrew had a lot to do with that. Um, so hopefully he'll tell us a little bit about that today. Um, but a bit of background on Andrew. So he co-authored the UK government's manual for streets and has helped plan movement networks uh, for some of the UK's most notable urban extensions and settlements um, and champions active travel, human scale places and joy in our streets. So some of you here have probably heard of places like Poundbury or Nansleden in the UK, La Plessis Robinson in Paris, uh, Brandevoort in the Netherlands, the Cotton District in Mississippi, or even locally, if you're here in Australia with me, Jindy in Perth. So a lot of these are new townships or urban extensions, but the principles of street design for these places uh, is equally applicable for urban infill and new precincts in our larger cities here. So just a little bit of housekeeping before I throw over to Andrew. Um, we will have a bit of time at the end for a Q&A. So what I'll do is ask you to just pop any questions you have for Andrew in the chat. Um, don't be shy. And then we'll, we'll, um, we'll go through those at the end. And we are recording this session as well for those who can't make it today. So a word to the weary. Um, but I think that's all from me. So I'll hand over to you now, Andrew. Brilliant. Um, thank you ever so much. And thank you for inviting me um, to have a chat today. Uh, it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning here in the UK. It's rainy and grey. So uh, I hope you're all relaxing of an evening wherever you might be around the world. Um, so um, I'm Andrew Cameron. I'm an engineer. Um, my background is in transport, in architectural engineering and urban design. But I've been uh, involved, lucky to be involved in, in many, uh, you know, new places, doing a bit of movement planning, doing a bit of street design uh, and writing a bit of guidance uh, around the world as well. And so really today wanted to share with you some thoughts on, on the joy of streets, uh, what came out of the work we did for the UK government on street design. Uh, and I'll try and do that with lots of pictures uh, and not too many words. Uh, and we'll, we'll whiz through and see where we get to. So, uh, just let me check, Millie, is that coming up? Is that moving on now? Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so um, the joy of streets. Well, um, back in 2007, uh, I helped co-author Manual for Streets for Department for Transport. Uh, and this was a real sort of shift in terms of thinking about good street design and, and getting away from the old, uh, you know, road based uh, approach. I wanted to call it joy of streets, but the Department for Transport wouldn't let me. Uh, I think they thought it was a bit too racy. Uh, I then helped write uh, the Scottish. And they uh, wouldn't let me call that joy of streets either. Uh, and then uh, we did uh, Manual for Streets 2. Uh, and uh, again, that didn't get called joy of streets. So if you're writing any street design guidance in Australia, then I think Joy of Streets is a far better title uh, if you, you get the chance. So what do we learn about streets? Well, um, many things uh, that they are quite persistent uh, in terms of uh, they tend to hang around for quite a long time. Uh, and a little bit like glue, uh, you know, they're, they're multi-purpose, uh, they're for all your needs. Uh, they're not always safe, acceptably safe is, is where we might need to think about streets and I'll touch on that later. And generally we can make them non-toxic. 
but they are that glue that holds our, our, our towns, our cities, our villages together. Uh, and one of the things that, that I always sort of like to talk about is the longevity of streets. Uh, you know, when we look at places that have got uh, uh, even a short history, you know, here's the street pattern from us, from Copenhagen uh, from, from about 500 years ago. And that street pattern hasn't changed. Uh, you know, what they've done is actually found other ways to get around and they've still got that tight knit uh, network of streets. Uh, and equally, this is the, the, the town I live in, a small market town in uh, the uh, Midlands in the UK called Newark. This is it from the 18th century. Uh, and this was the marketplace where they um, traded goods and where they used to hang people, but we stopped that recently. Uh, and, uh, and this is it now, and it's still a marketplace. It's still got all these things going on. Uh, and why is that? Well, it's the most connected place in the town. There's 13 routes into it um, for vehicles and for pedestrians and for bicycles. And that hasn't changed uh, in about seven centuries. Uh, so once we lay down the pattern of streets, uh, it generally tends to stick around for quite a while. Uh, and so here's the marketplace now. Um, and what fascinates me is that, you know, the buildings uh, have, have come and gone. Uh, and, and, you know, many of these are now uh, 20th century, some 19th century. There happens to be one 15th century timber building that somehow survived in the corner over here. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what we've got to think about is that when we set out patterns for, for movement and streets, it will generally outlive the buildings that surround it. Uh, and so if we plan for walkability, if we plan for good places, then the buildings come and go. This always upsets the architects, but uh, the buildings do come and go. Uh, and the street pattern, uh, you know, has a, a much greater longevity to it. Uh, and so why is that important? Well, as, as, as the great Jane Jacobs said 52 years ago, 51 years ago now, sorry, lowly unpurposeful and random as they appear, sidewalk contexts uh, are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life must grow. So if we get the street pattern right, if we make good quality places, people meet, people talk. I took this photo about 15 years ago uh, and, and, and love it because I don't know whether these people know each other or are they just stopping and having a chat. Uh, but, you know, streets are these convivial places uh, that make uh, us good human beings and make good cities. So if we design them well uh, and strike that balance between uh, different movement modes, uh, then maybe we're doing something for uh, making good cities. So um, how we lay out new places uh, and perform surgery on existing ones, sometimes we have to go in and uh, change things around, will influence how people choose to move. Um, so maybe if we start with walkability is where I always start, uh, then if we get those principles right, we're, we're perhaps heading in the right direction. Uh, and these are some of the diagrams that are in the, uh, the UK Manual for Streets. I, I, I drew these many years ago now, but we're still using them. And, and it was trying to explain very simply, uh, you know, about how we build. And if we build suburban sprawl and build zone development, uh, then we perhaps don't get the best results. So we can build housing estates. Uh, we can build schools, we can build business parks, we can build shopping centres. And then if we stick big roads uh, between them, uh, it doesn't become you know, a great place necessarily to uh, walk or cycle. And, and if you like, they're all the ingredients of towns, but maybe we've forgotten how to put them together in a sensible way. So we end up with, uh, you know, uh, big residential roads. This is in Scotland, um, you know, where the, uh, the, the houses don't face the street and there isn't even a footway because they think people won't walk. Uh, this is very recent in the UK, uh, not a good example where, you know, the car sitting outside the front door means that's the first choice for movement. Uh, and so perhaps we need to do things differently. Uh, this is in Atlanta, a wonderful out-of-town shopping centre, but I do like the way uh, if you ever want to drop a bomb on it and, and get rid of it, then the target is there for uh, instant demolition. But in the UK, you know, we're, we're still doing uh, these sort of uh, out-of-town and in-city shopping centres. This one's in the middle of a city. It could be anywhere. It's in Plymouth. But this is how it addresses the public realm. And, uh, you know, all this guard railing, uh, the blank facade, makes these people uh, you know, very much like a third class citizen. Uh, and so perhaps we need to do things a little bit differently. Uh, and so I've worked with, with Leon Crea, the master planner for, for almost 30 years now on, on places like Poundbury and Ansleden and in, in, in other places like Guatemala. 
uh, and and he loves his his little cartoons this is probably my favorite um explaining that you know many of our problems with cars you know it's not the car but the suburban home is this deadly weapon against uh, our urban centers uh, and if we build zoned places if we separate things out and there's no alternative but to drive then that's what creates the traffic it's not traffic itself so can we do things differently well this is the the, the complementary cartoon that we put in uh, manual for streets saying how do we mix things up how do we actually put the schools the shops the workplaces in with the housing uh, and then how do we make the streets in between and they're streets not roads uh, human scale slow speed um, so that uh, you can get across them and it knits the place together you create them as that that glue that holds everything uh, together uh, and of course this isn't a new idea uh, here's bath uh, in in the uk world heritage site uh, you know with incredible architecture but at the end of the day it's got connected streets and it's got mixed use uh, and so part of the thinking behind Poundbury and other places was how do we start to replicate that in new development uh, and bring the best bits of, of mixed use and connected streets to, to new places. Because we know that if we build this, uh, you know, suburban model uh, in terms of, of traffic, what do we get? We get traffic concentrated onto larger roads, bigger junctions, higher speeds, more vehicle miles at the end of the day, because it takes longer to drive everywhere. And conversely, if we build the mixed use, uh, you know, uh, urban model, traffic gets spread over a connected network of streets. Uh, this is a nightmare for transport modelers to model. So this is why they don't like it, but actually we've got to do it. Uh, we get smaller junctions, lower speeds and more walking and cycling. So how have we done that? Well, Poundbury in Dorchester, if, if you're not aware, Dorchester is a market town in the, in the south of, of England and uh, it's on land owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, uh, who uh, 30 years ago now, decided to, uh, uh, with the council, build this urban extension to the west of the town for two and a half thousand homes um, and, uh, you know, to use this as the kind of 35 year growth plan for, for the market town. And, and at the time, the, the, the Prince of Wales, who's now our king, uh, was uh, uh, in charge of the Duchy of Cornwall. And he'd seen what had happened to some of their land previously, which had been you know, used very unwisely for suburban development. And he said, we should do things differently. We should actually you know, uh, really uh, try and reach out to building a proper place with mixed use, with great streets, with good architecture uh, and build a community. And that's where the idea of Poundley was born with, with Leon Creer as master planner. I first started on it 28 years ago. Uh, uh, it still isn't finished yet. It takes a long time. To build a town but uh, you know but here's the the master plan in a bit more detail and you know all I want to say here is if you look at the different colors you know it's this idea that we were going to build a mixed use place and not just two and a half thousand homes but two and a half thousand jobs and we started with this it was a notional rule of thumb one job per home we said does that actually make a good place for uh, for, for life and community uh, and so all the different colors are the shops the schools uh, there's industrial, there's offices, uh, and you can see it's all pepper potted throughout. It's not in the corner in, in an office park or a, a business park. Uh, it, it was trying to build a, a, a proper town with all those things cheek by jowl with, with homes and with people. Uh, and so that was the master plan. Uh, 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 this is, is what it looks like now. We've still got about uh, four or five years to go. But what's been interesting, uh, you know, just looking at what's been delivered, uh, you know, back in 2020, there were 1600 homes and 2200 jobs. So we we're actually slightly ahead of ourselves on the jobs, 1.3 jobs per home. But uh, uh, this is delivering a 34% walk and cycle uh, to work mode share, which is uh, incredible for, for new places. Because so often, you know, they're car orientated and, and people have to jump in their car to get to work or go to the shops. And here, because uh, the, the streets are nice uh, and because there is stuff to walk to, people walk and cycle. Uh, and so this is now, uh, you know, becoming uh, the mainstay of, of what we should do. It's still difficult to get some developers to do it, but it's written into government policy. It's in Manifest Streets. It's in other government planning documents as this is a model for, uh, for, for good development. Uh, and so what does the mixed use look like? Well, uh, you know, top left, this is the first square. There's a, there's a, a, a village hall. There's 
shops and pubs there's an estate agent there's a curtain making business there's a baby business uh, not making babies but selling baby clothes uh, this is a, a factory making chocolates which is 2000 square meters next to houses offices uh, pub and flats above retail store small convenience store with with flats above so the the, the mixed use is designed to be compatible with uh, the feel of the place uh, and to to work with it uh, and as I said, 1.3 jobs for every home built. Um, but what's interesting, there's now been some independent economic research looking at, uh, you know, what Poundbury does for Dorchester, because it is an urban extension. Uh, and, you know, that compared it to a, a, a similar scale development. This was uh, Elvertham Heath, uh, which uh, was uh, at the same scale and, and as an urban extension, had only three businesses, 63 jobs. Uh, and was generating 1.4 million in rateable value rates for the council. Whereas Poundbury, 207 businesses, 2,300 jobs uh, and, and 5 million odd in rateable value. But also Poundbury pumping in 105 million a year to the local economy. Uh, so this isn't just good for the local uh, you know, people who live there, but it's good for, for its neighbours as well. So what does it look like? What are the streets like? Well, this is Queen Mother Square at the heart of it, which is is quite a big place. The uh, you know the architecture might not be uh, to everyone's taste, but that's what the Duchy of Cornwall do, uh, and it's grand. It's a civic space. This is the main square, which is uh, uh, designed. Uh, here we are as a uh, it's actually a roundabout on a raised table, but it doesn't look like a roundabout because we took away all the highway geometry. We actually said if we want this to read as a square then having uh, roundabout signs and white lines everywhere doesn't really help. So uh, there's a roundabout geometry embedded within that space. These are courtesy crossings that uh, people can cross on if they want to, or like this chap, you can cross wherever you want. And then this, this wonderful grid uh, laid out on sort of a five metre square. Uh, so people know where to park. People park at the edges. They don't park in the middle. You know, that's just common sense. Uh, and something at the heart, which is is a statement for uh, for the town, but it accommodates uh, cyclists, uh, you know, who, who use the courtesy crossings as well. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the local access group about how to accommodate uh, people who might be less able, uh, and and we've met some great people. They that they, they make us wear the funny glasses that your uh, you know your sight is uh, uh, is limited, and they push us out into the road to see what happens, which is is fair enough but trying to design it to be a really inclusive space. These are some of the streets we did, you know, very simple shared edge lanes where lightly trafficked, no need for a footway, but pinching them right down to you know, 2.7 meters to, to, to accommodate the pedestrian crossings. Uh, 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 places where walking, scooting, cycling, wheeling uh, is part of it. And that's really part of the culture now with the school. And fundamentally based around the, the walkable neighbourhood and a really simple diagram. Uh, this is from the Urban Task Force in 1999, which, which I helped on. Uh, and, and saying that if we plan around, uh, you know, that five minute walk for places, which is about 400 metres in, in the UK. Uh, you know, we've done this in, in the Middle East and we use about 300 metres because you can't walk as far. We've done it in Africa, we use about 800 metres because people walk further. But if we plan around that walkable neighbourhood with connected routes, with transit, with mixed use, uh, then, then what happens? Well, research from the States, I won't read all of this, but shows we get nearly three times as much walking, uh, which we think is, is a good thing. So uh, for, for, for all my projects, uh, I spend a lot of time doing this, understanding existing neighbourhoods and that five minute walk, plotting new ones where we might have to do some surgery. Uh, sometimes they aren't round, they might be sort of oval shaped if it's a linear high street. Uh, and it might be slightly more than five minutes if it's a walk to uh, a secondary school or, or a railway station. So we spend a lot of time doing that uh, and then, uh, you know, lay on top of that the idea of, of connected streets and mixed use. So here's the first phase at Poundbury. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, abutted onto, this is the existing settlement of Dorchester. Uh, and it's a semicircular shape. Uh, here's the plan. Uh, and why is that? Well, it's half of one of these walkable neighbourhoods. Uh, it, it's literally that diagram, uh, you know, cut in half and placed next to the existing settlement. Uh, and, and what you'll see is there's a, near, a series of streets. It's like the spokes of a wheel. You know, there's some pedestrian only streets here, some quiet streets, another pedestrian only street that all lead to that small centre uh, with the village hall, with the pub, with the shop, with, uh, uh, with the shops. 
uh, uh, so that people have the ability to walk there in an easy way. And this one isn't quite five minutes, it's, it's a little bit smaller, but it's literally that walkable neighborhood. Uh, and then what did we do? You know, as you look at the blocks here, we, we created obviously good frontage onto the streets with buildings uh, looking onto them and put the parking at the back. So there are parking courts, which we've deliberately put at least three houses in every court to make them lively animated spaces, not just a parking area. Uh, and there was a bit of work done right at the start, looking at, you know, if you lived here, how long would it take you to walk to the shop to buy a pint of milk versus how long would it take you to go out the back and get your car out and drive to get that pint of milk? Uh, and the answer on average was double. It took twice as long to drive. Um, uh, and so again, not just the mixed use, but deliberately designing uh, to make walking the first choice for movement has been part of the Poundbury philosophy. Uh, and one of the things which I think has been really successful, there are people on the streets, people stop you and talk to you. Uh, normally, if they recognise your face and they know you're involved in it, they've got a question about something, but that's good. That's people caring about the place they live in. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, the diagram for that, to, to explain this, and, and I remember I coloured this in about 27 years ago <laughs> in terms of uh, the, the, the strategy, but before Manual for Streets, you know, the, the guidance we had in the UK was about distributor roads and access roads and cul-de-sacs. Uh, and so here was a, a hierarchy of spaces and they were connected. So there was things that uh, are, are, are human uh, orientated, squares, streets, lanes, courtyards, mews, uh, that people understand rather than distributor road or spine road, uh, you know, which are technical terms. And so one of the key things we've done in Manifest Streets is to try and kill off all that highway engineering speak uh, and call stuff uh, what it is. But also notice everything's connected to everything else. Uh, you know, there isn't a sort of a, a tree-like hierarchy of, you know, big road, medium road, little road. Uh, it's acknowledging that in good streets, in good cities, everything is, is interconnected. So, so I remember colouring this in. Uh, there was the diagram, and this is what it's like. So here's, you know, some of the, 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 the streets. Uh, uh, with, with the architecture, we tried to keep the clutter down. So the street lights are on the buildings, the street names are on the buildings. Uh, there aren't uh, any white lines or you know signs. We still haven't posted a speed limit uh, because it's all designed uh, for either 30, 20 or mainly 10. Uh, and, and we recognize that people drive according to the environment. So if you tell people to drive at 30, they will drive at 30. But if you design it for 15 and don't tell them what the speed is, they'll drive at 10. Um, so we've had a deliberate policy of, of not posting uh, uh, speed uh, limits, uh, but actually accepting that people uh, drive according to the environment they're in. Uh, and then doing really simple things in the front of this image. Uh, you know, I call this a Copenhagen crossing, but continuing the footways at key junctions um, to give that implied pedestrian uh, cycle priority uh, and you know what do car drivers do they stop and they wave or flash their lights and let people go again creating that sort of civil uh, civil space uh, there's a whole network of uh, pedestrian and cycle routes so there's that filtered permeability uh, but they're well overlooked uh, and they're the most direct routes again putting the pedestrian first this is one of the the pedestrian only streets um, uh, which is quite tight in terms of, of building to building. Uh, technically, you can drive a vehicle down here, uh, and some people might drive to their front door to unload the shopping, but then they uh, you know, park around the back. And these have been really successful in terms of, of creating that network. Uh, and then these are the courts. I mentioned the parking courts. This is one of them with uh, uh, you know, high quality landscaping with dwellings in them, um, so they're not just a parking area. And that's how we deal with the car uh, at the back. The other interesting thing at Poundbury is, is, you know, when we started, this is suburban edge of, of market town and the policy was 2.7 parking spaces per dwelling on average. Uh, we only provided 2.2 uh, because of the mixed use nature of it. We argued that down and the last survey showed the take up was about 1.8. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're also seeing a move away from the high levels of, of car ownership uh, in Dorset. Uh, because people know they've got everything on their doorstep uh, and, and they buy into uh, you know, a lifestyle where they don't need two cars or three cars. They're generally a, a car down on that, which we think, again, is, of course, is a good thing. 
Uh, and so the other uh, technique at, at Poundbury, and, and, and this is another diagram in, in Manual for Streets, uh, I remember colouring this one in as well many years ago, was this idea of, of how we design streets. And, and so often, you know, people start the design of a place with, with, you know, we've got to build a main street or an access road or a distributor road, and it's got to be 6.5 metres wide for two buses to get past each other. And they do all the road bit first and, and then plonk the buildings around the edges. And at Poundbury, we took a different approach. We said, actually, what are the spaces we want to create? So, uh, it, you know, here are, uh, are the buildings that should create a street or a square. Um, and then uh, in the second diagram, you know, let's make the, uh, the, the curb edge of the, the footway generally follow the buildings because that looks better. And that's how it works in traditional to, uh, towns and villages. And then let's track the space we might need for vehicles through the middle. Um, uh, and, you know, in places this might be a little bit wider and that might mean, oh, someone might park here because that's, you know, a sensible place to park. And in places it might pinch down. We might actually create that traffic calming, but doing it with the buildings, not by putting in humps and bumps. So it was a very much a different approach to, uh, to street design, which I still use and we still advocate as a way to you know to create good places is is not that road's first approach and, and here's here's one of the streets uh in in poundbury this one is uh is is probably a sort of secondary tertiary street but it's traffic calmed uh you know the the, the curb lines follow the buildings uh and the traffic calming uh is is this it's called a house um because where this house has been placed uh it limits forward visibility around the corner to 10 miles an hour uh, and uh, sure enough, people drive at 10 miles an hour, because uh, if you drove any faster, you, you might not see what's coming and you might have an accident. And then you have to go to the police station and fill in lots of forms and your insurance goes up and, and all those things. Uh, and so this traffic calming by place, as, as I call it, has been a real uh, uh, success, I think, in terms of changing the way we slow vehicles down. And we're not doing it by imposition, we're doing it in a more, more natural way. Uh, and what's the difference? Well, it, you know, other places that still design around visibility uh, often put too much in. Uh, and, and this is the Roman town of, of Chester, new development. But this great big wide junction, you know, this triangle is the visibility splay on, on that corner, which is enormous. And all this space gets wasted so that vehicles can pull out faster uh, uh, onto the junction. You'll see the guard railing the trees. Everything's laid out according to the visibility splay. I'm sure you do this in Australia. Uh, you know, you'll start to notice that, you know, we're, uh, we're letting the engineering dominate everything. Uh, and then this is where pedestrians are supposed to cross. Uh, and of course, like this lady, we all walk in straight lines. Uh, and so this is the only techie bit I, I want to show today. But some of the research we did in Manual for Streets was uh, with TRL, Transport Research Laboratory, looking at uh, visibility uh, and uh, they uh, kind of did this bit of research and sort of told us the obvious but you know speed of vehicles increases with road width you know the wider the road or the wider the lane the faster people drive and speed of vehicles increases with visibility for links you know for streets and for junctions uh, and and it's kind of obvious but pointing this out we we then turned it on its head and said well actually if we want to slow things down uh, in, in places, then we should take visibility away because the converse is true. So if there's less street width and less visibility at junctions, then drivers will drive more slowly. Uh, and that's just what we did. Uh, so the uh, guidance that was written in Manifest Streets, we rewrote the visibility criteria for, uh, for, 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 for England and Wales. Uh, and so the new guidance, you know, 30 miles an hour, you, you provide 40 or 43 metres of visibility. That used to be 70 or 90. Uh, so we've almost halved it. Uh, and for 20 miles an hour, we're down to 25 metres. So we've really reduced these uh, dimensions, which allows we can make junctions tighter. We can uh, waste less land uh, and, and, and give space over to, to good public realm. So it's the only... Ticky bit. I don't know what the standards are in Australia, but uh, uh, something to question, uh, I think, you know, that if we, we start to design in more and more visibility, it was always that perception that makes places safer. Uh, but actually, the converse is true uh, of, of actually slowing things down. So it was a little bit 
uh, uh, like telling Department for Transport, you know, all this time you thought the world was flat, but now it's actually round. Uh, but we managed to get this through in the guidance and it's been a real, a real win in terms of changing things. But of course, we kind of knew that, you know, when we looked at historic places, this is Annick in Northumberland, uh, 10,000 vehicles a day go through this little arch. There's no visibility uh, pretty much on either side. Uh, and the accident record is, is not existent. It works perfectly well. Why? Because people slow down. They don't want to crash. They don't want to have an accident. Uh, I still want to build one of these, but I haven't managed that, that quite yet. So that's Poundbury. Uh, I mean, I'll talk very briefly some of the other projects I've been involved in where we've applied you know, manual for streets. This is, is Nans Leden in Newquay, which is 4,000 home urban extension. But in a similar way, you'll see these five minute walks to the local neighborhoods. There's a 10 minute walk to the center. So designed around uh, uh, walkability as a first principle. This is the, the, the vision for, for that center. Uh, this is the uh, reality. This is what's built uh, as of last year. So the first square is, uh, is a square with a, an obelisk skin. It's a skewed roundabout, again, hiding the geometry to make it feel like a good place. Uh, and we're doing those simple things. Here's another Copenhagen crossing all the way down to the centre, you know, level for pedestrians and cyclists, changing the perception of, of who the place is for. This is another one is, is a new town called Sherford uh, in, in, in Plymouth, uh, which has a, a main street running through it. We think this was the first sort of new high street built in, 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 in many, many decades but predicated on three of those walkable neighbourhoods. So here are the neighbourhoods, the main street runs through the middle with the bus. And this neighbourhood has a primary school, this one has a primary school and, and the shops and the services, uh, and this one has a secondary school. So applying that five minute walk, and of course they overlap a little bit. Of course, some people might be a seven minute walk or an eight minute walk, but designing around that principle uh, because we know it delivers more walkability. Uh, and, and as always the nice watercolour, uh, the, uh, the Welcome to Sherford, this is a bridge for bats, which uh, was insisted upon, uh, although I think all the bats have left. Uh, but here's the main street and, uh, you know, really simple things, zebra crossings. You know, I'm a big fan of these in the UK because as a car driver, you, you have to stop uh, and it sets up that, that hierarchy. Uh, and then uh, one more, this is, is a new town in Inverness uh, called Tornagrain that, that I've been involved in for the Moria Estate. Uh, which we uh, we worked on with Andrew Stuani from, from DPZ in, in Miami. 5,000 homes, three schools, shops, uh, similar principles of, of good neighbourhoods, good walkability uh, and mixed use. Uh, and so there's that street hierarchy, you know, like the, the, the Poundbury diagram, but uh, uh, nicely done to show everything connected to everything else. There's that walkability plan showing those five minute walks to centres and to uh, to transit to bus routes here. Uh, and, and here's the first streets, you know, this is the, the, the street down to the centre. Similar principles, the, there's no white lines, there's no speed. So there are some speed signs at the edge here because we're, we're growing it. Uh, but putting the, uh, the street names on buildings, uh, reducing the clutter, keeping it simple. Uh, and then there's courtyards again to put the parking uh, at the back uh, and these are some of the uh, apartments and studios above the, uh, uh, the, the the parking which actually sold really well uh, and then some really quite intimate spaces uh, throughout the development and this is the center with a shop and a pharmacy in there already uh, and again built around you know the idea of a square uh, for, for the heart of it so i was just going to touch Briefly, I think we've got 10 minutes or so just on, on some of the street design elements that go into to all of these. Uh, and, and I suppose what I've learned over the years, uh, uh, just as a, some food for thought, those were the examples, but, you know, really taking the, the principles. But we know with street design, it, you know, so often it, it wasn't about vehicles. It was about sanitation and, and fire. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until we started to build new places. This is the Edinburgh New Town. Uh, where uh, it's the first one I found where the street width was determined by the turning circle of a six horse carriage. Uh, so it started to be designed for vehicles rather than other elements. And then these things turned up. This is the Mercedes Benz from the uh, late 19th century, uh, responsible for the first pedestrian road death in London uh, and also responsible for uh, a fascinating uh, uh, road crash in Cornwall 
uh, at the time in Cornwall, there were only two cars registered in the whole county. It's a big place. Uh, one of them was one of these, uh, and they both managed to crash into each other, even though they were the only cars in the county. And I imagine they probably got excited about seeing another car. But these things turned up, and then we started as engineers to create all this standard geometric criteria. Uh, and then we get standardised layouts. We get cul-de-sacs, we get distributor roads. Uh, and so that's what Manifold Streets was trying to break down, acknowledging that you know a street is a highway that by its nature has important functions beyond just the movement of people and traffic. And this idea of place was was really set out in the the document that we could think about you know places in terms of movement. This was some work by by a chap called Stephen Marshall. You know, there's a movement hierarchy, but also there's a place hierarchy. Uh, and as we start to overlay the two, there's this notional graph of movement and place. Then we think about how we design differently. Uh, and so what we put in Manual for Streets was was this idea that you know if you just design for movement, you're going to get all these things: motorways, arterials, collectors. But if we design for place, you know, it's a lane, it's a street, it's an avenue, it's a boulevard. And it's almost that difference between roads and streets. Um, uh, and then as you recognise that you're designing an avenue or, or, or a town square, and it's got that place element, that's where you need to, you know, have your highway guidance, and it is just guidance, but also think about the place. Uh, and then you might need to ignore or change some of the guidance as part of that process to make a good place. And so this as a concept was, was really key to, uh, to the document. And I think has stuck, you know, people get this now in terms of uh, designing good places. And if you like, it's this, you know, this is all about movement. This is in Scotland, but here's a distributor road, you know, posted at 50 miles an hour. You could drive this at 70 easily, not a great place, but that same bit of tarmac curb to curb down the road in Dunkeld, same dimension, uh, you know, here's a high street. Uh, it's got some parking. It's not actually wide enough for two cars to get past each other. But is that a problem? Uh, because it slows everything down. The accident rate is is really low for this. Uh, it's not perfect. The footways could be a bit wider. Uh, so think about, you know, can you use the uh, the space creatively? But also we talked a lot about, you know, streets being the integrators of communities. Uh, they need this thing called crisscrossability, made up word. Uh, and like this chap who is Pythagoras, people like to walk in straight lines uh, and we should respond to that. Uh, and this was some work I did many years ago in Ipswich. Uh, uh, I told them to take out all this, they had all this guard railing around the city centre and underpasses. Uh, and I said, this has got to go, you know, this doesn't create a good place. And it took them 18 years to do it, but this is it now. And you could walk across the street like this chap. So we can change big roads, we can make them into streets. We can make them human scale. This is 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 down in South London, putting the street lights down the middle of the, the high street, uh, uh, you know, and, and slowing things down, narrowing it down. What's interesting, you know, in England, we, we still have this thing called a road safety audit. So people want to paint white lines down the middle and put bollards in and, and put keep left signs, you know, around here and light them, even though they're under a light and cars have had headlights for over 100 years. Uh, but this was all stolen from the Germans who did it first in, in uh, Hennef uh, and did it without the, the signs and the lines uh, and a much better quality result. So um, we set out in the manual the hierarchy of users, pedestrians, cyclists, public transport, service vehicles, then other motor vehicles. Getting away, this is the old guidance in the UK, traffic in towns, uh, which had these sort of diagrams in it of, of separating things out. We said, no, they need to be together. Uh, you know, this is what that document delivered. This has now been knocked down and rebuilt. Uh, and if you like, it's about putting the, the pedestrian first, but not going too far. You know, if we put the escalator up to the gym uh, for pedestrians, then maybe we're missing the point. Uh, but, you know, how do we strike that balance? Uh, and equally, uh, you know, if we completely go the other way, this is, uh, it's, is real. This is the magic roundabout in Swindon, which is five mini roundabouts with a big roundabout in the middle and we just design for the car, then we end up with spaces uh, that don't work for pedestrians and we need to unpick these. But slowly we're doing that there, you know, in, in other cities, this is Nottingham, built in the 60s, uh, very large roundabout, underpass, they even put a shop down here, they thought it'd be a nice place to shop. This carries 20 odd thousand vehicles a day, but was cutting off the city centre from its hinterland. Uh, and it's now been put back as a crossroads, uh, uh, underpasses filled in, uh, and so we can change big, busy streets in our city centres uh, and make them human scale again. And this is that same junction, direct uh, uh, desire lines responded to for pedestrians, 
uh, greening and public realm, you know, or, or all that space. And so finally, you know, we do have this thing called road safety audit in the UK where uh, it, it can be a bit of a nightmare. People come along and start to think about everything that could go wrong. So we start putting bollards next to lampposts. We start putting signs up like this, warning people about owls, uh, which was a true story about an owl hitting a motorcyclist uh, and him having an accident. Then they put signs up to, I don't know whether it was for the owls or for the motorcyclists, uh, to try and stop that. But one of the things we did in Manipur Streets, we looked at the, the, the legal side of it, because so often we were told, you can't do this, you know, you'll be sued, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work, uh, uh, it, it's not permitted. Uh, and there's one key bit of, 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 of law, case law in the UK, which I'll just touch on, Gorringe v Calderdale, back in 2004, which is still used. And a lady, Mrs Gorringe, was driving home one evening around a, a sharp bend, and she crashed into a bus that was coming the other way. Uh, and she was injured, but she tried to sue the council because the bend had always had signs up saying slow uh, and slow painted on the uh, on the tarmac, um, you know, warning drivers of that bend. Uh, and she didn't win her case. It went to the Lords. And what they said uh, is, is really interesting. They said the courts must not contribute to the creation of society bent on litigation, which is premised on the illusion that for every misfortune there is a remedy. So accidents happen. And then Lord Hoffman, uh, you know, people must accept responsibility for their own actions. The users of the highway are expected to look after themselves. And drivers of vehicles must take the highway network as they find it. Uh, and so I don't know what the law is in Australia, but this was a fascinating nugget for us because it meant you can do this stuff. You know, ultimately, the driver is responsible for, for that metal box. And as designers, we have to be sensible. But actually, uh, you know, we can do some of these more uh, place orientated schemes without that, that, that threat or that reasoning that they, that they won't be uh, delivered or, or, or they, that you could be sued because of the way you designed it. So, uh, you know, just very quickly, design codes are, are, are mentioned in the document. You know, we've, we've put several of these. This is a new uh, settlement in Northampton that I was involved in, very simple code, but getting codes, not just in section, but in plan, thinking about where utilities go and, and then just showing that, you know, what you could draw gets delivered. So that's the main street. The street with suds in is, is here. Uh, the the double-sided street with suds, uh, you know, here as well in the courtyard. So these are all the, the latest sort of things we're using quite a lot now. And then finally, it, it is about looking at the place, not at the car. You know, not that roads first approach, the buildings, but as I described, buildings, then, then streets. This is another one of Leon Creas. Uh, this is what happens when it goes wrong. You know, people build in this huge visibility uh, splay on the corner of a junction and then this chap thinks it's somewhere to park so the visibility is killed off anyway or alternatively at Poundbury you know here's a square very limited visibility uh, at the junctions either end uh, slows everything right down uh, and getting that first choice for movement right I think is key if we're doing this if all the cars are outside the houses then people will get in their cars uh, or this is another project I've been involved in in York uh, the cars are at the back and you walk out of your front door and what's here? It's your bike. Uh, so that becomes the first choice for movement. So really planning for that uh, is what you'll get. And then just be careful. I always say about what are rules and what is guidance. If it, you follow uh, the, the guidance, uh, this is meant to be a play space for children uh, designed to the right scale and in the right location. But no child has ever played in here. Uh, so the rules sometimes do not work. But at Poundbury and Upton, this is Upton, uh, the kids actually don't play in the playground, they play in the suds because that's more fun. And at Poundbury, the kids play in the street uh, because it's slow speed and why wouldn't you? So be careful of rules and guidance uh, and uh, enjoy good streets. How we structure places, you know, will influence how people move. Of course, we want to design for walking and cycling. Uh, and, uh, you know, remember the street will be around for a long time. So uh, get the, the, the planning. Uh, of them right is what I would suggest uh, and that's me uh, that's a lot of photos uh, hopefully there's some food for thought there uh, and some experiences to, to share from what we've been doing in the UK over the last 20 or 30 years thank you that is just brilliant Andrew um, the magic roundabout roundabout is um, mind-blowing I don't I don't know whether combined with the low flying owls that's some kind of upside down world harry potter or something but it's just um <laughs> hilarious thank you 
And the picture of Poundbury with the kids playing on the street um, is is what we should all aim for, I think. So um, I, I will throw to anyone who has a question now. So um, no one's got anything in the chat, but would anybody like to shoot one verbally to Andrew? Anyone got a burning question? Because if nobody does, I do. <laughs> um, so, well, Andrew, look, I think it, a lot of us in Australia and probably other countries as well, um, we'd love to have something like the Manual for Streets and the, the Scottish equivalent. Um, in, in the interim, you know, when we don't have it, I think a lot of us here today are planners in urban design, um, you know, strategic planning industry. Um, when we do have conversations with traffic planners, so when we find ourselves in that scenario advocating for all the stuff that you're talking about, what are some of the tricks and tools we can keep up our sleeve? Um, you know, what are the, you know, what do you say to them? Because, you know, you've had these, so many of these conversations and um, you've clearly won them. So I think you can teach us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, and uh, one of the key things that, that I keep coming back to is, is about speed and, and, and speed of vehicles and, and looking at uh, what might be alternatives. And, and, you know, for example, you know, as I tried to illustrate, you know, taking away visibility at, at corners is, is only going to slow things down. Whereas often, you know, the local authority highway engineer or county engineer might be saying, actually, well, we want more visibility because I think it'll make it safer or we want the street to be wider because the refuse lorry needs to get past a bus or needs to get past a car, even though it might only turn up, you know, once a, once a week. Uh, and what I'll say to them, I'll say, well, actually, if you're doing that, you know, if we're designing for more visibility or for the refuse lorry to get past, it'll mean for the other 99.9% .9 of the time, cars will drive faster in, in this environment. Um, uh, and then there's a great, uh, I didn't put it in the talk, but there's a great little diagram that shows um, your likelihood of being killed or seriously injured as a pedestrian if struck by a vehicle, uh, which increases exponentially above 20 miles an hour. Uh, and, and your chances of being seriously injured are, are much, much greater. Uh, and then you sort of lay this on the table and say, well, actually, is this what we want? You know, do we want a faster place? And and, and if there is an accident, then then more injuries and, th and that can win them over quite often in terms of if we're trying to design places that work for for everyone uh, and so i think that's one one tool to to, to bring in and, and the other you know i don't know about australia but many of our districts here and local authorities have declared a climate emergency now in, in terms of uh the, the crisis we're, we're all facing uh and, and 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 again it's pointing those things out you know if we put the car as the first choice of movement people will drive more. Uh, and how does that address their climate emergency that they've declared? Or if we're designing places where you step out your front door and your bike's there, or it's a good street to walk, then, then you are addressing it. So I think it's turning some of these things back on them is, is part of the tools to, mm. uh, to try and persuade. Mm. Well, it might be worth me um, getting some of that research from you and distributing it so that we've got those sources and, um, you know, data. That would be great. So somebody has asked if healthy streets assessment have been undertaken on any of the places that we were talking about. So I think that is a United Kingdom um, methodology. I don't know if you're aware of it, Andrew. Um, yes. Um, yes, I, I don't know if it's been done on, on Poundbury or, or Nansled. Um, I, I know at Poundbury we've done a, a survey every sort of 10 years of, of residents uh, and people who work there, which has been just asking them questions. Um, but I think it would be a good thing to do because we've got, uh, you know, we've got healthy streets. Uh, there's other guidance from uh, from Design Council and, and others as well about assessing streets. Um, but no, I, I think why not? You know, it's what we're all trying to trying to aim for uh, and, and you know certainly at, at Poundbury you know uh, because we've got those higher levels of of walkability and cycling I'd hope it would score pretty well. Yes it would be interesting to do that so another question here is so Andrew um this is about Australia I don't I know you have worked a little bit in Australia but somebody's asking whether you've come across any um, good formal guidelines that have been produced here Uh, I, I haven't personally come across mm. 
the, the guides uh, in, in mm. Australia. Uh, the work I did was in, in Sydney a few years ago. Mm. But I think it's, uh, again, it's, you know, we did this at, at Poundbury and elsewhere. We looked at what the guidance said at the time. And, and remember, if it's guidance, it, it's a guide. It's not mandatory. Uh, and so it's about mm. unpicking what might and what might not well uh, work well. And, and some of the squares we did at Poundbury, we looked at similar size spaces in, in villages uh, around Dorset, uh, because we thought actually we want this to feel like it's of Dorset. And, and we surveyed there and we looked at the accident data and, and the accidents were non-existent or, or very mm. minor. And we used that as sort of first principles approach to, to argue to build some of these spaces. Mm. By saying, look, here's one, you know, it's 200 years old. Uh, there's been one accident in the last 30 years. Uh, you know, why can't we build something very, very similar here? And and that was the argument we used. So it's almost stepping back from the guidance. Mm. Because quite often the guidance uh, and, and manual for streets, we were very deliberate not to put sort of standard street layouts in it. Uh, we said people should go and look at context and character and, and work it out for themselves, which has had mi mixed success. Some people can do that. Others, it's it's in the too difficult pile. Uh, but I think, you know, going back to those first principles is is really important as well. Yeah, well, if there's one thing coming out really strongly, it's just respect for common sense and, you know, <laughs> not autonomy, you know, referring constantly back to a set of rules that are um, being too rigid. Um, so some interesting, really specific questions here, which could be interesting to tackle because, um, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So one about trees which Sean asked, is there a reason that um, there's not so many trees planted in some areas of Poundbury? Or perhaps they just need some time to grow? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a good question. And, and there's, uh, there are quite a lot of trees at Poundbury now. Um, and street trees is, is such a big issue uh, everywhere around the world because they, they bring so much benefit in terms of, of, of shade and, and adding quality and, and, and slowing things down. Uh, I worked in the States many years ago and, and one of the highway engineers there, I think it was Mississippi, uh, and he wouldn't call a tree a tree, he called it an FHO, which is a fixed oh. hazardous object. Oh. And they could only see trees <laughs> as, as things that people would crash into. You know, oh, and, great. And, uh, so there's a cat um, stuck up that fixed hazardous object and yeah, my I, son I, I, climbs I, I, them all the time. As well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I wound him up by just talking about trees all the time. But, and, you know, they yeah. wanted trees to disappear. Oh, but yeah. um, but at Poundbury and, and elsewhere, you know, what we've tried to do is uh, is, is design it with the right uh, start with the right soil volume is is key because the soil volume will determine how big the tree will get uh, and then how we uh, uh, marry that with protecting utilities uh, and all those things. Uh, and so at Poundbury, some of the trees in the first phases now are getting pretty big, but that was always intentional. Mm. Uh, and maybe that's why there's there's less of them because we're trying to squeeze everything in and not make the streets too wide. Um, mm. But it's interesting. I think on, on other projects now we're probably putting more trees in and seeing greater benefit from trees mm. than we did 30 years ago at, at Poundbury. So uh, again, yeah. the thinking is is evolving. Uh, but the big issue in this country is who looks after them and quite often councils will charge. It's called a commuted sum, quite a lot of money. To look after trees um, or we get you know schemes with uh, long-term stewardship and, and, and the, the the landowner or the factor will look after the, the, the landscape. Yeah yeah well interestingly enough a lot of the great European cities and towns of the world don't have many trees but the beauty of the um, street and the architecture tends to make you not really notice. Um, there's so many questions I will get through as many as we can so um, from Jeremy um, who's asking um, if we don't have enough street width for two metre wide footpaths on each side, is it better to remove the curbs, i.e. the gutters, and encourage vehicles to park up against the fence line with people walking in the middle of the street? Right. Um, so what's interesting, and I don't know if this is the same in, in Australia, but the, the, the two metre footway it here is often determined by the utilities that run underneath it um, and that's the the water the phone line the electric and the gas or the gas is being phased out uh, and, and at Poundbury and elsewhere what we've done is taken the utilities round the back through the courtyards uh, and that actually means that we can have variable foot, uh, footway widths rather than you know sticking to that two meters for utilities so I think uh, you know the, there's ways to do that um, 
but I think if you know you're you're looking at the parking, uh, you know, uh, parking's often I see it as a, a creating some of that side friction in streets. So even if the street is narrow, having the footway next to the buildings and of a reasonable width is is the best thing. Uh, and then the parking can be part of the traffic calming as well. You know, so if you're squeezed on space, uh, having the parking, uh, you know, in the street and slowing things down, I think is part of of, of the best way to to organise it. And that definitely thanks, happens thanks, in Melbourne. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> can you hear me, Millie? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that question, Jeremy. Can, yeah. I, can I jump in with a follow up? Yeah, for sure. Just, just the yeah. two meter width, um, I guess, here wasn't intended to support utilities. It was intended to support adequate width for people on a wheelchair, being able to pass right. in the opposite direction to a person walking. Right. And that's that's in, in some of our design guides is targeting a two meter width of a footpath. And if we wish equity of access, then what do we do with all our narrow streets? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. And, and you know, we, we generally, again, have that two meters for, you know, a wheelchair or a pushchair to get past each other. We know that in places we might have to pinch it down and, and that's pinching it down to one and a half, but only over a short distance. You, you know, so if you're coming in a wheelchair and someone's going to get a push chair and you know you're going to meet at the pinch point, you generally negotiate, you know, who goes who goes first. But I think, you know, it's it's about squeezing the carriageway. If if we haven't got the space, um, then then how do we you know really take the carriageway down uh, as much as possible? And again, some of the research we did in Manual Streets. We looked at the um, level of vehicle flow at which people felt comfortable to walk in the middle of the street, so making it a level or shared space. And that figure was about 110 vehicles per hour, I seem to recall. Uh, so it's only one every, you know, uh, uh, what's that, two, two a minute or something, you know, so it's not a lot. And then people actually feel comfortable walking in the street, and quite often the vehicles will then drive at the speed of the pedestrians. Uh, and so if it's low volume, then that might be a solution as well of, of sharing the space. Cool. OK, um, there's one from uh, K.A. Some initials. Is it better to why that? Sorry, not that one. The roundabouts actually encourage cars to drive faster through intersections and therefore they are not as safe as they are made out to be. Yeah, I mean, roundabouts are, are interesting and uh, generally we're, we're finding in, you know, in urban places that uh, traditionally designed roundabouts, you know, which often start at, at about 28 or 29 metres diameter here, uh, are, are quite land hungry and, and for pedestrians and cyclists don't offer a great solution because often your route is deviated around the edges uh, for cyclists on the roundabout. Uh, that, that there's quite a high level of accident rates as well because of the turning movements and what have you. Uh, and so either we're trying to um, disguise them, like the Queen Mother Square example, you know, which looks nothing like a roundabout and delivers 10 miles an hour or less in terms of its design with those direct uh, you know, courtesy crossings, uh, or, or squeeze them right down. And we've been experimenting in this country with what's called a roundel, which is, is sort of a mini roundabout. So there isn't a raised central space to it, but a much tighter diameter, maybe down to 15 metres or less, which means you can keep the desire lines for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, uh, you know, where they should be and slow vehicles down. So I think, you know, I'd caution against that the big traditional diameter roundabouts don't work well in, in urban centres, but smaller, compact, uh, uh, or, or squares or disguising them, uh, uh, you know, I call it upgrading them to a square, uh, you know, are ways that we can achieve those movements, but not for vehicles. And I think the question is right. People do, as a driver, see them as a challenge. It's almost put your foot down. How can you get around it as quickly as possible? Yeah. There you Interestingly, go. The, the magic roundabout example in Swindon <laughs> with the five mini roundabouts and the big one in the middle, has got an excellent accident record because it's so yeah. confusing. It's so People confusing. don't know what they don't know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and as drivers, they, they they all crawl around it. So bizarrely, ah. it, it does work in terms of safety, okay. even though it's That's not a great approach. pedestrian environment. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I really like this question because it kind of speaks to the balance between um uh you know street design and and pull and I guess policing speed. So Tanya said it, it was a great presentation and thank you. Um, so with safe speeds and systems in mind, on your slide about the deliberate policy of not posting speed signs, 
um, and, you know, using the street design as, as a safety lever, it makes logical sense, but can the opposite approach successfully work where we retrospectively enforce lower speeds over an entire area without too much physical intervention? Um, Lucy Saunders, who, who is coincidentally in Perth on healthy streets, mentioned yesterday about streets in central London um, now have a 20 mile per hour speed zoning, even though some were originally designed for much higher speeds. So how has compliance to 20 miles an hour in these areas performed over time in London? That's a good question. And I think it's it's horses for courses. So new settlements where we're we're designing from scratch, you know, like Poundbury, we, we, we don't need to post the signs. Uh, still legally at Poundbury, it's it's a 30 mile an hour limit because the highway code, which is a legal document, tells you that if you're in an urban area with street lights, then the speed is 30 miles an hour. So we've used that as a default. Uh, and of course, that's from zero up to 30. But London is a good case, yeah, where we've got uh, an historic street network um, and, and now many boroughs are, are doing exactly as, as has been said, going down to 20 miles an hour or less. And, and that blanket posting, I think, does work as well because people understand it. You know, you're now entering the borough of Southwark, 20 miles an hour blanket. Um, but also in London, it's quite heavily enforced with, with speed cameras uh, and, and people know there are speed cameras and, and people get fines and their friends get fines. Uh, and so there is that that, that stick as well. Um, generally, though, I mean, in, in London, uh, even, you know, post COVID uh, in, in the rush hours, you know, traffic, I think, is averaging 11 miles an hour, you know, because it's such a congested place. So the 20 default uh, is, uh, is is it might actually be hard to achieve just physically at the busier times of day. <laughs> That's really interesting. I mean, there, there's a really big push in Australia to um, reduce, you know, suburban speed limits to 30 or 40 kilometres an hour in those cul-de-sac zones that you were, um, you know, that you were showing pictures of with really curved streets that were designed for 60 kilometres an hour. Um, and so, I mean, I really don't like that approach personally. To me, that slows down motorists in a place designed for motoring, and I just don't think it's um, serviceable to both parties, but um, that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, Radhika has asked about focusing on the visual connection and barriers. So what do you think about formal designs and street layout turning into informal layouts and also addressing the contrast between pedestrian routes versus vehicular routes? Wow, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, do you mean barriers as in uh, barriers for pedestrians? Uh, well, Radhika, did you want to jump yeah. in? I see that you're still online there. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, hi, thanks for the uh, wonderful presentation. No, so for me, what I mean is like how when you say pedestrians like to walk in a straight line versus yeah. we put visual barriers as buildings for um, cars to turn around and put bottlenecks and stuff like that. So do you think that layout of straight lines is actually turning into informal layouts because we're putting barriers for vehicular movement? Uh, right. And yeah. would it be best to separate vehicular movement from um, pedestrian movement routes. Right, got you. I think, um, no, that's it's a really interesting question. I think there's a balance to, to strike here. Um, and, 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 and I often describe this as, as, you know, when you look at a place and, and try and, I suppose, wayfind as a pedestrian, that's done through a whole host of different mechanisms. And, and, and sometimes it's the line lengths of streets, you know, we recognise the straighter streets as, as being more, uh, you know, important in the hierarchy, but also finding our way around, we do it with physical things, with digital things now, and, and the cognitive element is key. So, uh, uh, you know, I agree, the more we, we twist and turn things uh, for vehicles, then it might become less legible for pedestrians. But at the end of the day, I, I think if, if, if we're designing for walking, then we need to try and respond to those, those, those desire lines for, for pedestrians and for cyclists uh, and make the car perhaps deviate a little bit further. But what I've learned uh, and your last point, I think separating them out, if we try and uh, you know, create you know, different pedestrian routes and different vehicle routes, and we've experimented with this so much, places like Milton Keynes is a new, new town in the UK, uh, and the traffic in towns document that I showed, you know, was was advocating this as well. 
but so many of these things we're, we're unpicking now and we're just we're putting you know pedestrians and vehicles back in the street scene where appropriate and doing it all together because i think that works well in in terms of good place making so i think that the segregation can can be dangerous uh in terms of, of separating everything out because you know the vehicles they do provide a bit of life they provide some eyes on the street if they're driving carefully and they provide access uh, as well so it is that balancing act uh, which i think is is key to it well, I loved how you started with Copenhagen because the, you know, the, the ancient kind of road design has, which was for walking, now works really well for cycling. So, you know, as cycling advocates, you really want to be almost advocating for walk, walking. <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah. But I'm conscious we're five minutes over. So thank you, Andrew. This has just been so, so um, brilliant and um we've got so much to learn from you um, in Australia and and over the rest of the world. So um, on behalf of all here, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's been, uh, <laughs> great to share how we're getting on. Yeah. It's, it's not perfect, but uh, we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction, hopefully. Cool. And um, for those on the call, I'll try and follow up with some of those um, pieces of data that Andrew mentioned. And please do stay in touch um, if you're not signed up to street level, uh, jump on our website and you can register there. Thanks everyone. Have a great night and day. Have a good evening. Thank you. All righty. See you later. Bye. Bye.